Good afternoon, everybody. Dr. Michael Jacobs here at the Fertility and IVF Center of Miami. And uh, welcome to our weekly Monday afternoon chat. Uh, today's chat is uh, uh, what What can I do to, to get pregnant if my partner's sperm's not working that great? And the uh, idea here is obviously that to successfully conceive a child, it requires both uh, input from male and female partners. And when you look at infertility in general, uh, and uh, you ask the question, what are the causes of infertility? You'll often find a female problem. Sometimes you find a male problem. And if you look at those breakdowns, you know, about 35% of the time you find a female issue, 35% of the time a male issue. 15% a combination and 15% it's unexplained. So if we focus a little bit today on the male side, uh, we can ask ourselves the questions of uh, how do we know if my partner's sperm is okay? Uh, and if it's not, what can we do to improve it? And if we can't do anything to improve it, how do we get that sperm to work better? So, you know, the first step in any evaluation of the uh, male and particularly part of any evaluation of a couple is for us to assess is the sperm okay and that's done by doing what's called a semen analysis and this is done with ejaculated sperm where the sperm is looked at under the microscope and we look at three main parameters uh, how much sperm is there which is the sperm count the motility of the sperm which is the percent of sperm that are actively moving when you look at them under the microscope and the shapes of the sperm, otherwise known as the morphology of the sperm. And we use a very strict criteria for looking at shapes of the sperm uh, 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 to assess that. Uh, there are some other factors looking at the pH, the viscosity, whether there's inflammatory cells present and so forth. But the key three parameters uh, that really guide us in how to treat couples are to look at the count, motility, and morphology. A normal sperm count would be about 15 million sperm per cc. A normal seminal volume in the ejaculate is only between two and four cc's. So you don't fill up a whole cup with an ejaculate. You get you know, two to four cc's is less than a teaspoon uh, as far as the volume. Uh, uh, and uh, even though guys think they're ejaculating tons of fluid, it usually is not a whole lot. Uh, the uh, count would like to see at least 15 million sperm per cc, motility of at least 40%, uh, and morphology uh, at least 4% of the sperm being normal. So that having been said, it means that 95% of the sperm are not normal, and that's a normal semen analysis. So uh, most men don't have all normal sperm. Most sperm are not normal in appearance. A normal shaped sperm is, uh, has an oval shape to it with a tail and the tail is responsible for the movement of the sperm. So naturally, where does fertilization occur? Uh, fertilization occurs in the tube, actually. So what happens naturally when couples get pregnant is the egg is ovulated, the tube picks up that egg, and the sperm, which obviously is usually ejaculated in the vagina, has to swim through the cervical mucus, get into the uterus, find the opening to the tube, and find the egg itself to fertilize it. Once it finds the egg, it has to penetrate this cumulus mass, it's a kind of cloud of cells around the outside. So that sperm that either, there's not a whole lot of them that are swimming properly, they're not gonna make it upstream uh, into the tube to find the egg. And, and if it doesn't have normal motion to it, if its motility is poor, uh, or the shapes of the sperm are not normal, its ability to penetrate this sort of protective layer around the uh, egg uh, is compromised, so it can't get into the egg to fertilize it easily, so you, you don't get as high a pregnancy rates. You can see pregnancy rates with low sperm counts. You can see failure of fertilization with high sperm counts, but in general, the lower the absolute number of sperm uh, that are modal present, the less likely we are to see conception occur naturally. So let's, we've worked up a couple, we found on the female side that uh, we've got a woman who ovulates uh, pretty regularly, her tubes are open, her ovarian reserve uh, is good, uh, it's not too old, everything looks great, 
and just not getting pregnant. And lo and behold, we do a semen analysis and we find that the uh, sperm counts are not normal and motility is not normal. So what do we do at this point? The first question is, uh, is there an obvious explanation as to why it's low and can we do anything to improve it? So we always get a second semen analysis. The timing of semen analyses is very important in that we should have an abstinence window of between uh, two to three days, ideally from the last time ejaculation has taken place. And that will give us usually the best sperm parameters to look at. Uh, if two repeat tests are, are both uh, abnormal uh, and they're giving us the same basic information, then we don't need to repeat it more and more. If we're getting totally divergent answers where one is good and one's lousy, then obviously we get a third one to see which was a good day and which was a bad day. Sperm counts will vary from day to day, from month to month, and even men that have consistently low sperm counts occasionally might have a good sperm count and men who have good sperm counts can occasionally have a low one. So if we get an abnormal semen analysis with low counts, the, the issue is, okay, we repeat it, comes back abnormal again. So the next question is, what's the cause of it? Is there something we can do to, to improve it? So the, uh, the way to approach this is to do some hormonal testing for testosterone and what are called gonadotropins, meaning FSH, LH, and as well as some hormone tests called prolactin, thyroid, and occasionally uh, estrogen levels. But testosterone is the main one. Uh, in order to produce sperm, you need two things happening in the testicle. You need a stimulation uh, to the sperm in the form of FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, which is the same hormone a woman releases to stimulate egg production in the ovary and you need the presence of testosterone in the testicle uh, and the combination of having FSH and testosterone in the presence of stem cells, which are in the testicle to produce sperm in the first place, will help sperm be produced and develop normally. So if you have a low testosterone level, that can sometimes be associated with a low sperm count. Uh, if the testosterone is level low, we like to get the, the other gonadotropin levels, the FSH and LH, to see if they're normal, low, or high. If the testosterone's level is normal, then there's no benefit to using any hormonal treatments, basically. Because the sole hormonal treatments, whether it's giving testosterone or Clomid or HCG or gonadotropins are gonna do is to increase testosterone. If testosterone is normal, it's not the cause of why the sperm count is low. The, if the testosterone level is low, then the FSH and LH levels become somewhat uh, uh, important in giving us a hint is the problem in the testicle because if, if the testosterone level is low but the FSH and LH are high, you already have evidence that the pituitary gland is trying to stimulate the testicle to produce more sperm and more testosterone. And uh, in doing so, uh, in, and if that's the case, usually men won't respond to Clomid. If you have a situation where the testosterone level is low and the gonadotropins are low or low normal, uh, then sometimes in those patients you'll see an improvement in sperm production over three or four months. Uh, in cases where sperm counts are under five million and are very, very low, then we do some additional genetic tests to look at what's called a karyotype, as well as a test called a Y chromosome microdeletion test to look for the actual part of the chromosome that codes for sperm production to see if it's normal or not normal. If there's no sperm at all in the ejaculate, then the volume of the seminal ejaculate is important to know to see whether the sperm is getting ejaculated retrograde, meaning it's going backwards into the bladder instead of outwards into the uh, ejaculate uh, through the penile urethra, or uh, it's just blocked somewhere and the system is not, uh, there's sperm in the testicle and it's not coming out or it's being produced but it's going the wrong way or in non-obstructive aids of spermia where there's no sperm and there's no obstruction and the sperm's not going the wrong way, it, the testicle just isn't producing any, 
uh, we have to differentiate those because the treatment's different. But the majority of patients, you have a sperm problem or a seminal uh, a problem with the sperm count, motility, and morphology. Uh, the issue will be, are we seeing this in the face of a low testosterone level that maybe we can fix or a testosterone level that's normal or where medical treatment's not gonna matter. Uh, anatomic assessment of the male is important, and for that standpoint, a urology visit is helpful to see if there's evidence of any anatomic lesions. It's fairly rare to find tumors and cancers and things like that. Uh, usually you find nothing. Occasionally we may find a source of infection in the prostate. Uh, occasionally uh, you'll find uh, uh, what's called a varicocele, uh, which is a dilated vein in the testicle. Uh, when you find varicoceles, the question is, is it related to the low sperm counts? And you can have varicoceles and have normal sperm counts. You can have varicoceles with low sperm counts and fixing it doesn't improve anything. Historically, if we go back 35 years, men that had uh, varicoceles almost and were infertile as a couple, almost all of them had surgery to repair it. And about 50% of the time, you will see improvement over three to six months in the seminal characteristics in men who've had varicocele repairs. But sometimes you see pregnancies improve and sometimes you don't. And in very, very, very low cases, it's less likely to see uh, significant improvements in the sperm count to get a pregnancy. So what's changed over the years is our ability to treat men with low sperm counts because 40 years ago, everybody that had a varicocele had it repaired because otherwise they weren't going to get anybody pregnant. And if the fact that it didn't work that well didn't really matter because it was better than doing nothing. But nowadays, uh, we have not only the use of intrauterine insemination, but also IVF. In cases of no sperm being present, then besides doing the blood tests and doing the physical exam, a testicular biopsy becomes very important to differentiate between men that have no sperm getting out at all because of obstruction, blockage in the system, versus men that are producing, not producing sperm at all, and there's nothing wrong with the tubular system. It's just that the testicle is not producing sperm. So what do we do here? First thing is do a semen analysis. If it's abnormal, we repeat it. We get some blood tests. We make sure that those are uh, acceptable. Uh, if they're not, we can consider the use of Clomid. Uh, we would usually make a referral to a urologist in certain cases to uh, assess for an, a problem. In cases where there's no sperm at all, then the urology visit is absolutely necessary to assess uh, for sperm in the testicle itself. And now, obviously, if there's something that we find that we can treat that gets better, we can sit back for three to six months and see if the sperm improves and if the couple gets pregnant. If that doesn't occur or time isn't really uh, uh, something we, we want to just sit on our hands and wait, if timing is more urgent in women that are older with diminished ovarian reserve, where this has just been going on for so long, people are fed up that you want to go ahead and treat, then treatment forms in two basic uh, categories. And, and part of the medical history before we get into treatment is to make sure that there isn't a, a confounding uh, variable to cause the sperm to be low or, or not existent at all. Uh, it, very important to not use testosterone, not use bodybuilding drugs, all these medications, these androgenic steroids can inhibit sperm production. And even if you testosterone is low, if you take testosterone, it can kill off the sperm, basically. So you don't treat a low testosterone by taking testosterone. You don't treat male infertility by taking testosterone. Please do not take testosterone. So obviously, if, if the only history is they're taking testosterone, you stop it. We can wait and see if there's a rebound and the sperm improve. If you're on a medication uh, such as Propecia, that can cause low uh, sperm counts and so forth. You stop it and we wait and see what happens and usually with that things will get better, particularly if we have a suppression effect from it documented uh, uh, from the hormone tests that we do. So now we let's assume that the sperm doesn't get better 
and we have a low sperm count, but not a disaster of a sperm count. By that I mean, if a normal sperm count is 15 million, 40% motility. If we have sperm that either have a low sperm count in a five to 15 million range, if we have motility, instead of being 40%, it's 5% or 10%, but good counts or low morphology, then how do we get the sperm to work better? And, and the first approach is to do intrauterine insemination. Intrauterine insemination is done by taking the sperm, washing it in the lab, separating out the most active sperm, and with a small catheter to put that sperm up into the woman's uterus in the middle of the cycle at the time of ovulation. The best results occur when you do that in concert with uh, an ovulatory drug uh, like Clomid or injectable fertility drugs because it helps increase the likelihood of the sperm getting to the egg at the right time. Uh, usually we try and inseminate people within this 12 hour window when we can predict ovulation is going to occur and by using fertility drugs and triggering ovulation it helps us time that to optimize the sperm getting to the, uh, to the eggs. When you do intrauterine insemination, you're putting the sperm in the uterus. The sperm still has to swim up into the tube. It still has to find the egg, still has to fertilize the egg. The embryo, which is formed, still has to be transported by the tube back to the uterus. And that embryo still has to stick in the cavity of the uterus in order for a pregnancy to establish itself. So pregnancy rates are going to depend on how good the sperm is, the more compromised it is the lower the chances of success are going to be. Uh, if we have at least 5 million sperm and everything else is looking good, then certainly we can give inseminations a try and we'll usually use either Clomid with insemination or Femera with insemination in patients that are older, uh, meaning in their late 30s, or early 40s, we tend to use a, a mini stim protocol often, which is a combination of Clomid and very low doses of injectable fertility drugs and in, in some cases, using the injectable fertility drugs alone will give us uh, a better outcome. In cases where pregnancy is not occurring with this approach, or the sperm counts are very, very, very low, then inseminations usually aren't going to work. And in that group of patients, or in patients that have confounding factors on the female side, either they're not ovulating properly, and ovulatory drugs aren't working that well, or there's a tubal obstruction, uh, or they're just getting older and, and the quality of the eggs that they're producing uh, is gonna be less rather than more, then moving more directly to in vitro fertilization makes sense. And if you look at the use of in vitro fertilization for the treatment of male factor infertility, if you go back you know, 35 years when we started doing IVF, or 38 years ago exactly, but if, if, if 40, 41 years ago. But if you look at patients with IVF in the early days of IVF, the advantages in a dish, when you, when you inseminate sperm on their own, you would take 50 to 100,000 sperm and mix it with the egg and wave them good night and hopefully they would fertilize the next day. And you'd use the same 50 to 100,000 uh, sperm, whether, uh, the male had 2 million sperm in the ejaculate or 20 million sperm in the ejaculate. So you'd think, well, 50,000 50, sperm is 50,000 sperm, but the reality of it is it doesn't work the same. Uh, in men who have very low sperm counts, very compromised sperm, the, there's a qualitative issue, and now sperm don't work as well to fertilize eggs. So success rates for fertilization rates in IVF, where you just take a bunch of sperm, prepare it for IVF, mix it with the egg, put it in the dish and wait and see if it works, tends to not work very well unless you do something to force fertilization of the egg. So in the mid-90s, a procedure was developed called ICSI, intracytoplasmic sperm injection. And what this allowed you to do is to take a single sperm and under the microscope with a very fine glass needle, you can select what appeared to be the best sperm, take that sperm and inject it into the egg and get good fertilization. And what this told us is that 
the sperm, even though they were, were from uh, men with low counts, low motility, or even those with no normal morphology, all the sperm were funny looking basically, you had good fertilization rates and babies being born. So the issue of sperm when it's not moving well, or you have low counts, or the morphology is not normal, most of the time, that's an issue of the fertilization process itself not occurring. And if you take the sperm and you microinject it into the egg, you can force fertilization to occur, and you don't need a ton of sperm. If we have 15 eggs, I need 15 live sperm to work with. So even men with less than a million sperm, you process it and wash it, you lose some of it. As long as there's live modal sperm in the ejaculate, usually we can find enough sperm to inject into eggs and force them to fertilize. So the benefit now is that whereas 30 or even 25 years ago, having a very low sperm count on the male side pretty much meant I got to use donor sperm, which is an option. But most couples prefer to use sperm from their partner, not sperm from a sperm bank. With IVF, once you inject the eggs with the sperm, you get good fertilization rates. The embryos divide and develop. You can grow them in culture for five or six days. You can biopsy them to make sure they're genetically competent and put those embryos back into the uterus. So you can take a couple that just isn't getting pregnant on their own that would have under a 3% chance of getting pregnant with inseminations because the sperm counts are so low and do IVF and get a 50 to 60% pregnancy outcome with the transfer of a single embryo. So IVF, in vitro fertilization with intracytoplasmic sperm injection or ICSI has become the mainstay of treatment for severe male factor infertility. It's also a mainstay of treatment for patients with mild male factor infertility that haven't conceived with use of intrauterine insemination. In men who don't produce any sperm in ejaculate, but have sperm in the testicle, whether it's because of the fact that they had some obstruction from infection, from previous surgery, had a vasectomy, all of these things would result in nothing wrong with the testicle, sperm are great, the problem is they're just blocked, the tunnel is clogged. And if you aspirate these sperm from the testicle, you can take those sperm, inject them into eggs, get excellent fertilization rates, excellent embryo development rates, excellent chances of having normal comp genetically competent embryos and excellent success rates when you put those embryos into a normal uterus and have a baby nine months later. So, you know, the keys here with male factor infertility, one is confirm that the sperm is not normal on at least a second occasion. Don't go by a single sperm count. We would never in our program make a definitive judgment. You have to do this based on a single test. Second thing is, is there something we can do to fix it that requires some blood work, physical exam, sometimes urology visit, uh, sometimes more elaborate testing, depending on what the finding is. And then the third is, how do we get this to work? How do we get you guys pregnant? And that's usually either using one of two different technologies, the first being a combination of an ovulatory drug with intrauterine insemination, and the second being in vitro fertilization with intracytoplasmic sperm injection. The latter, always the best. The latter, much more successful, much quicker, and gets you to a much better outcome uh, in a shorter period of time. So that's pretty much the story on male factor infertility. Uh, if, you know, obviously uh, it, it's important for the men to come in and get tested. It's important for the men to be part of uh, the fertility evaluation with their wives. We treat couples as couples and we uh, uh, will do our best to get you guys pregnant in the most expedient way possible. Uh, and. Uh, the issues of do I need insemination, do I need IVF, do I need a testicular sampling, or is the only choice I have if there's no sperm at all, do I need to use a sperm donor, which is certainly an acceptable alternative as well. 
So have a good afternoon and wish everybody well and stay safe. And please uh, let us know uh, if we can help you. We love your questions. We love taking care of you. And uh, we love helping you reach your dreams and uh, of uh, having a healthy, safe pregnancy. Take care and have a good afternoon.